We apologize for this brief interruption in the show. As many of you likely know, the Higher Standard Podcast is officially sponsored by Transcend Company. Transcend has been my longtime provider for both testosterone and peptide therapies, but they offer so much more. Whether you're interested in health, wellness, or longevity, it all begins with you getting your blood work done. A lab draw will help you get the numbers and establish your baseline. You can go to transcendcompany.com slash THSP. That's transcendcompany.com slash THSP. Or you can click the link in the show notes on any streaming platform and on YouTube. Fill out your information, and one of the representatives will contact you to get your journey started today. Now back to the show. I know you haven't been the show in a while. Whenever he counts in, so it doesn't say one, but you press the button. Okay? <laughs> but he, he, no, but he hasn't pressed that button. The clock? He, but he started already. You no, know that. No, but we don't, have... Don't be that guy. Don't, you're being that guy right now. You don't now. know what to do with your hands now? Is that what it is? <laughs> no, it's, dude, it's, it's all saints guys, over here. Guys, 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 get into the show. Oh, he's here. Oh, Holy oh, shit. Oh, can come you on, believe it? On. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Jeff is not liking this. Is it Jeff? weird that we had to hire him on Upwork? <laughs> <laughs> We've got him from Fiverr. Yeah. <laughs> I asked for a larger salary, and now I am back. <laughs> there you go. Oh, there you go. That's hurtful. One penny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have a great show for everybody today. Today, we're actually going to start off the show with a segment that Chris and I actually get pinged on a lot. We have covered it on previous episodes, but we thought we'd go over it a little bit more in depth and give you guys our takes on what we do for our families. So a listener has reached out to us, uh, Rosalina. Shout out to Rosalina. Um, and she says, do you guys have an episode on investing for children? You guys helped me immensely in starting my own investing journey, but I'm now wanting to start investing for my son. I'm getting all sorts of information online. It'd be helpful to know the difference between a 529 account, a custodial Roth IRA account, and a brokerage account. Thanks so much. As an immigrant from a socialist country with zero knowledge on investing, you guys have really helped me set myself up for retirement. Wow, I almost want to figure out what immigrant from what socialist country. That, that, that's just a whole yeah. lot of backstory right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't get that very often in the details. But yeah, she was awesome. She reached out, and I, we actually, I shared this immediately, and we all love messages like this, so I thought we'd get into it. What Saeed is trying to say is we need more messages like this. We like this. Be direct, brother. Don't be yeah. coy. No, no, but we, we pick certain ones that we see as a recurring theme. Right. All right, so what? before we get into this, I want to take a little bit of a pause here and say something that I think is important, okay? Everybody, when it comes to investing like their health, has a different philosophy which may or may not work for them. It's like intermittent fasting. It works really well for some people. It doesn't work very well for other people. Low-carb diets, uh, high-fat, low-protein diets, I mean, the... You name it. There's diets for everybody. And somebody will tell you, oh, my God, this is the most amazing diet in the world, but it works really well for them, and it's probably not going to work so well for you. Or if it does, it might work differently. Investing is no different, right? Just because one of these works really well for somebody doesn't mean that it's going to work really well for you. You kind of have to figure out what's going to be in your best interest, what you can do long term, and what you think your kids are likely to better off using. And I'll get back to that towards the latter stage of this discussion when I explain what I did for my son and why. Right, exactly. So I think the important thing here is that, first of all, she's even thinking about this, right? Yeah, that's the right thought. Yeah, that's the right thought, exactly. And the next question is, what's the purpose, right? Is it for college? Is it maybe to help them in the long term, maybe a down payment on a home, mm -hmm. right? Is it maybe to help them buy their first car? Because for each of these, there could be different vehicles that you could use in order to get to that destination. So for kids, I have, I have two schools of thought when it comes to investing. Part of me thinks, okay, think about some of the best athletes in the world. LeBron James started playing basketball when he was really young. Serena, really, really young. Father was very, very obstinate. You were going to do this. This is what you're going to do. Right? Tiger Woods, same thing. Say what you want about their upbringing. Their parents had a path. They mandated that they follow this. And they early, early, early on and never let up on the discipline they expected from their kids. If you take this path with your kids, part of me goes, okay, you know what? You're going to have a fantastic 529 meant for college, and your kid's going to use it to go to college because you're going to be somewhat forceful here. But the other part of me says, maybe you don't need to take this aggressive path with deciding your kid's future in advance. Maybe, just maybe, you take a more liberal path to investing with something that's a little, got a little bit more usability and a little bit more dynamic in how you can use it from a tax perspective. 
and you say, if my kid doesn't want to go to school and they want to start a business, they can do that. If my kid wants to go to school, they can do that as well. It, the tax ramifications are different. So you got to figure out which kind of parent you really want to be because some of these investment strategies only work under certain scenarios and have certain benefits. I agree. So, so if you're not thinking about those benefits long term, then you're really lying to yourself early, early on and it's going to hurt you long term. But with each of them, it's about knowing the basics, which we're going to cover on the show, and also committing and being disciplined to the time that it'll take. Right. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Um, we're going to start off with an example that helped one of us go viral not too long ago. Always back to the viral clip. <laughs> Always back to. The... So we we've, we've we've talked about it routinely on the show about you know the eighth wonder of the world being compound interest. Right. So I did some maths. I did the maths. The maths math in right now. And um, if you were to invest fifty dollars a month, I didn't want to go the traditional route of a hundred dollars a month. Thought it'd be too cliche. Let's go just fifty. Keep it a little simple. So just to be clear for the audience, you're recreating your own viral clip on a subsequent show? No, but on a different, about a specific topic on compound interest. It's the same topic. <laughs> not, yeah. You're a dirty, sneaky <laughs> bastard. Okay. So $50 a month with an average rate of return of 7% a year. We know the S&P 500 on average gives you a return of somewhere between 10 to 12%. Mm -hmm. So we're being conservative. Not according to the internet trolls, just for, <laughs> just for clarity purposes. Yeah. Yeah. They really hate me for saying 7% return. I'm like, come on, guys. Most common error with them calling you out is they didn't account for reinvested dividends. Reinvested dividends, and also it's looking at the average rate of return over a 30-year period. Take any 30 years, it's around at least 10 to 12%. Yeah. Okay? So that's where that comes from in case you were wondering. If you were to invest, this is actually pretty crazy, $50 a month. For your, for your child, starting at the age of 25, okay, till the age of retirement, 65, they will have $131,000. Age of 20, that goes up to $189,000. Age of 15, $272,000. Age of 10, you can start investing $50 a month, $389,000. Notice how this is starting to be a hockey stick up, mm -hmm. right? Age of five. $556,000 starting at the age of one, $737,000. The difference in contribution from age 25 and age one, only $14,000. So um, I, I say this with a grain of salt because I know, again, people get really, per they, they really get frustrated with this. They say, okay, Chris, okay, Saeed, fine. It's a lot of money. But that money in the future with inflation, that's only going to be able to buy me a hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> and I think to myself, okay, let's just say hypothetically you're right, that with inflation, it's going to be a lot less valuable. It's still more than you would have had had you not have done anything. And nobody is saying that this should be the only thing you do for your child. Precisely. Right. I mean, this is just an added benefit that you can give them that you can pass on to them as well, right? Well, it's also one of those things you can pass on during your lifetime. So, so much of the mistake that I see people who are generally up and coming into the middle class or maybe middle class their entire life is they don't have legacy assets they can leave to their kids unless they die. I guess in theory, that's better than nothing. But at the same time, the whole point of being able to support your kids and giving your kids these opportunities is getting to see them have the opportunities during your lifetime or God forbid something happens to you when you pass away, you know they have things like this set in place to provide for them in your absence. These are not the only thing you should be thinking about as a parent, but they are certainly things that will give you enrichment to know that, number one, you helped them get there, and number two, you provided an opportunity during your lifetime to make their life better. Because, look, we all came from different places. Some of us had a leg up and help. Some of us did not. And I can tell you right now, Unequivocally, those who've had a leg up generally have a better trajectory for the same reason that compound interest works so effectively. It's because if you start somebody off farther down the, the process to success and closer to the end goal, the the faster they're going to get there. Absolutely. And just imagine the conversations are, that you'll have around the dinner table when you start talking about this. Look, uh, Jimmy or Jane. <laughs> Why Jimmy? I don't know, man. We're in this position that we are now because... We thought about this how many years ago? 18 years ago. We were able to afford this for you because we were putting away a little bit at a time. 
that lesson in and of itself right there for them is, I mean, that's priceless, right? And it's something that I've routinely started to do now is like I would, I like to gift like a share of a stock to a kid, right? If mm-hmm. it's somebody, a kid's birthday. You strike me as a AARP kind of guy who does that. <laughs> and I get you the whole stock certificate yeah, also for you to ones. frame. Yeah, yeah, have to, right? Yeah, makes, um, makes total sense. Yeah, exactly. And I can tell them, look, you now own a piece of Mickey. That's that's partly yours. Right? So let's get into this. I think 529 accounts get a bad rap. I think we have given it a bad rap on the show, too. I don't like them. I, don't, I personally don't like them either because it's kind of like you're telling your kids that you're going to go to college, right? Because you're not going to make me throw away all these benefits. But, look, at the end of the day... If you were to take out that money for non uh, non qualified expense, college expense, you only you get taxed on the gains, not on the initial contributions. That I think that's something yeah, worth. But the noting. whole point of having a plan like this is to avoid tax liability. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, but some things that I found out and that I learned throughout this process in prepping for the show is you can use them f- towards trade schools, which I think are only going to become more and more popular as years yeah, come on. This is true. Okay, so that's also a huge benefit. You can use them for private education, K through 12. And on top of that, any excess funds after the fact, let's just say you have a smart kid and they're going to get a scholarship or you have a kid that's going to get um, uh, you know, a scholarship for, through sports or in, and they're not going to need uh, the, the, the funds, right? Well, any excess funds actually can be transferred into a, a Roth IRA account for them and can be rolled over starting this year. Thanks to your boy. My, J- my boy. JB. Uh, Mr. Biden. Well, yeah, again, I'm not a big fan of the 529 plan because I think that they're too confined in their benefits. And a Roth IRA, all well and good if you want to wait till retirement age to really get access to it. So therein lies the downfall in my mind. A Roth IRA is a retirement account. So if you're going to invest in your kid's future in a retirement account, he, she, they won't get access to these funds until they're of retirement age, at least with the tax benefits all in place. So to me, that really only leaves you one type of account that I like, and that's your traditional normalized brokerage account. And a brokerage account doesn't have the tax benefits, certainly does not, that you would normally get in these other accounts. But what it does is it gives you more flexibility. It gives you more of an ability to grow over time and choose what assets you want in the underlying account, number one. Number two, you can self-manage, self-direct this entirely on your own as at your cadence, at your convenience. And number three, let's say your kid doesn't want to go to college. Let's say your kid wants to start a business. They can do that. Let's say your kid wants to continue to grow this account while they get their first job and add funds to it, and now they're not starting from zero. They're starting from $100,000 or $200,000. Let's say you own, uh, you're an executive at a publicly traded company, and you get paid uh, stock compensation. You could literally move your stock compensation directly into this account as – just a straight transfer of one stock account to another stock account of, of the stock that's there in a cashless transaction. There's lots of different ways that I think this is much more beneficial for most people. And you don't have to fall in any one of those scenarios to be a benefit. But I think a brokerage account allows you the most amount of freedom, particularly given the access to accounts online right now. You can literally log into an E-Trade account, a Fidelity account. I mean, you name it, even a Robinhood account and start this instantly. True story. When my son was born, the day he was born in the hospital, there was a couple things I did, and one of them was from the, ho- the hospital room. I opened up a, an account at Fidelity where I already had it, my personal accounts. I called it Carter's account, and I instantly moved $25,000 with a stock, existing stock, into his account from my personal brokerage accounts. And I knew all the, the compound interest benefits and started this number, started that number, but I also knew, like you pointed out early on, that once you get to a certain number, that number really starts the, to increase at a rapid cadence. So I wanted to jump jumpstart his rapid cadence acceleration. Right. That was the intent. Yeah, that, that I mean, and that's amazing. And one that if, if you can afford, absolutely go ahead and do it. Right. So there's two types of custodial accounts that uh, if you go down this process, that you'll likely be opening up. It's either a they call it a UGMA account, a uh, Uniform Gift to Minors Act account, or a UTMA account, which is the Uniform Transfers to a Minor Act. One of them you can hold real estate in, right? The UTMA. And the other one is more for, like, cash, stocks, bonds, things things of that nature. I'm also much more simple when it comes to this, too. And this is not legal or investing advice. But as an attorney, I can tell you that's all well and good. Yeah. I chose not to do that. Yeah. I opened up an account that's in my name. Mm-hmm. 
that I use for him. I have allocated in my trust for my son should anything happen to my wife and I. But he has no access, no control, and it's not in his name until such time as he's an adult. I'll transfer it to him. And that, and that was the exact next point I was going to make. So with these types of accounts, as the as the minor, when they turn become an adult, they now have access to those funds. Mm-hmm. If that is something that's concerning to you, like, look, not all kids mature at the same cadence, right? And the last thing you want is to be handing over a boatload of money to someone that you had no idea was going to be financially responsible or unaware, not aware of what they want to do and they want to go invest some money with some friends into some business that you're like, this, this is not it, right? So if that makes you a little uncomfortable, the right thing to do, like Chris mentioned, would be to put it under a trust to where you can spell out exactly when you want them to have access to it. A really good friend of mine growing up came from a very affluent, wealthy family. And um, I never understood why they did something until I got a little older. But basically, when they turned 35, their kids all inherited a trust worth $35 million. And it was largely in securities and stocks. Um, And when I was younger, I was like, why 35? Why not earlier for college? Why not different ages? And then I had the conversation with the father at one point in time. And he said, oh, you know... As you get older, and he at the time, I think was in his 80s, he goes, as you get older, you start to realize how young you really are when you think you're mature. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's like, you start thinking you're mature in your late teens, in your early 20s. And you look back on decisions in your early 20s, you're like, yikes. You hit your 30s, and you hit your 40s, and you get this perspective that's different. And he's like, for me, I really felt like I was starting to mature in my mid-30s. He said, more importantly, if my kids do well in school, they'll get scholarships. If they don't get scholarships, then they'll learn to work for their money and they'll learn the discipline of working. And if they figure out a way to pay for their school and they graduate and they get a job, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to make good money. It's going to require them to have discipline and work ethic. And if I just give them this money before the age of 35, they're not going to be out on their own independent. They're not going to be working on, on, on their own to pay the rent and their mortgage. But by 35, they'll have figured out what life is, how difficult it is. They'll have found their way through it. And I give them this money. They will know how to, number one, use it. Number two, appreciate it. And number three, they'll value it. Mm -hmm. They'll value it because they saw how difficult it was for them to build whatever they built by the time they're 35 years old. Right. I really like that now as a father. I was talking to another, another father not too long ago whose daughter was a phenomenal baseball player. And he was a very, very busy working professional, but he always made time to go to his father or his daughter's softball games. Uh, she was a softball player. And she got scholarship offers, and one of them was to this Ivy League school they'd always talked about her going to. He was over the top, like super hyper excited. And um, she said no. Broke his heart. Blew him away. He said, why, why would you not? She said, I'm burnt out. I don't. I don't want to play softball anymore. To this day, he still has a real tough time just talking to her. He's so, like, hurt about it. Oh, man. It just devastated his world. But he's also said to her, well, you're paying for college. And she's like, Dad, you have, like, money set aside, and he has a 529 plan. And his response was, no. I'd rather pay taxes on that than allow you to unilaterally give up a scholarship because you want to chase something else because you don't appreciate the value of money. Why would I give you this money now? Yeah. I can see both. I can see both sides to that, right? I mean, it's tough. It's, it's tough. tough, right? Because if you're burnt out, she's burnt out. I mean, look, she might. There's some. Yeah, I never really bought into that whole college experience lifestyle. I get why some people w- would seek that out. Yeah. Um, but it was never really a thing for me, so I feel lucky that I didn't have a desire to do that. But um, the profession that we're in, I've been afforded the ability to review a lot of uh, wealthy people's trusts. Okay, mm-hmm. and it's very common. Like your friend that you mentioned earlier, whose father kept it from them until the age of 35. I've seen 35, 36, 37, 38 consistently mm-hmm. as the age. Because, it, and like you said, now in hindsight, thinking about it, I mean, I would hope my kids aren't just sitting around to the age of 38 waiting to begin to collect. Like, I'm not going to wait that long. I'm going to still go out, do everything that I need to do, build mm-hmm. a life for myself. And then this is just an added bonus onto everything else that I'm doing that hopefully they you know, are financially savvy enough to take that and grow it even more. 
Well, and if you want a visual representation of how impactful this is, if you think about it from a context of time, when you look at somebody who started to invest and you look 10 years out on an investment curve, it's, it's good. You look 20 years out, you're like, oh, my God, it's getting that hockey stick-like angle where it's just starting to creep up super fast. When you hit 30 years, 30 years of investing consistently over time, you start to really see significant upside in the potential to invest. Most kids go to college at 18 years old now. Mm -hmm. That's literally half the investment time horizon that they would otherwise get to get the benefit of compound interest. And if you look at any chart showing you compound interest, look at the difference between years 1 through 20 and years 20 through 30. It's night and day. Right. So if you think about it in the context of much farther for your kids than just school, you eliminate the 529. But you think to yourself, okay, look, I don't want them to, to get this money when they're 65. Because let's be honest, unless you had kids in your 20s, you're probably going to be dead, bro. Yeah. Or as Said now says, bruv. Bruv? You're not allowed to use that. I've been wearing an All Saints shirt, though. You're not from London. That, that's, that's why I'm allowed to. You're not British. <laughs> so you can't, anyway. Uh, so in my mind, the brokerage account is the way to go. And if you want to throw on things over time, like real estate assets or stuff like that, you can absolutely buy them and put them in their name. But when you start off, just go with the brokerage account. In my mind, it's the easiest, it's the most simple, and it's the most liberal with you can change and move over time. Especially with, you know? if you're if you're only choosing to do one, right? Yeah. But if uh, you're looking to do multiple things, like also save up for a car, I mean, there's like we said earlier, there's multiple vehicles for this. It really boils down to what is it that you're trying to accomplish for them. Yeah. Yeah. Get rich, man. Let's do this, man. Well, speaking of getting rich, welcome back to the number one financial literacy podcast in the world. Sitting next to me, my partner in time, the one and only All Saints wearing Said Omar. Thank you, my man. Sitting next to me on my left is my partner in crime, Chris Nahibi. Welcome back to the show, everybody. And a longer, more overdue welcome back to the show to the one and only DJ Arun behind the ones and twos. The backbone of the show, if you will. The backbone, huh? <laughs> well, speaking of backbones... And shows. Wait, no hello? Nothing? Just... No, Arun, I love you. And I thought of you yesterday night, late, were, late in the evening. When you were eating ribs? No, I haven't had ribs in a long time. We should go to Houston's and get ribs. Their ribs have to be... They are amazing. You've had it? Dude, once. One time. And it was so good, I've never had them again. You I can't, can't, you can't, do, can't it. do it. You can't do it, yeah. I got it last yeah. time we went. Then can we go? Next, we uh, the next uh, business meeting we have? The next we, pod meeting? We can. I just got to go a little earlier than 8.30. Okay. I'm I'm down for that, homie, bruv. I'm down for that. That's so not natural for you. No, it's weird. It's because you're not you British. Flex? Me or him? You. I just feel like that's a natural bruv yeah, thing to no, do. Yeah, he's channeling his inner Adam. Adam, yeah. I'm trying to. I'm trying <laughs> to like pop out, all his, all pop his out muscles. muscles whenever I turn my arm. He did it so naturally. <laughs> but um, you know how Saeed has often had an obsession with docking. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. There is something. I, hold on, I just hold on. You gotta clarify, bro. You can't just, bro. We can't share our group chat. I feel like you got an obsession with docking. You've talked about it multiple times in the show. Shares bro, you shared videos. articles hold on. about it. If you have that much discipline to dock, how do you not have enough discipline to just not? Well, to your point, there is a new sensation out there which doesn't apply to just one religious group or at least one primary religious group. It's called gooning. What? Gooning. Goon? I read a full Vice article on. on gooning. Man, goon. Uh, the term goon used to be a derogatory term when I when I was growing it's not up. Far off, say. <laughs> no. It's is... not far off. Wait, hold on. Oh, there it is. No, it's not the same thing as. Wait, who? I'm not reading this. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not reading this. Gooning may be most simply defined as the state usually achieved after a prolonged edging session. When a man becomes completely hypnotized by the feeling radiating from his penis. So, to to clarify, without <laughs> to clarify, um, we are trying to get flagged. <laughs> no, this is this is from Wik, uh, Urban Dictionary. Or Urban, yeah, Wikipedia. yeah, not Wikipedia. What am I thinking? Um, so, Vice did a full article on people who will go on trips and they bring all sorts of toys and set up their hotel hotel room. Come on, to. Arouse themselves to the point of, but not actually climaxing for prolonged periods of time. And there's an entire cult of people who choose to be abstinent from sex, but they do this. And there's not somebody else involved. This is basically you and yourself. What Bro, are the benefits? Uh, the, yeah, the, go ahead. Go ahead, Odin. Oh, what are the benefits? 
Uh, oh. I'll have to let you know. Maybe it's tantric. You read the article. You're gonna, what do you mean? You'll have to let me no, know. You're going they, to they give it a shot? They weren't like, let me tell you all the reasons why I do this. They were like. No, so to to that point, okay. Um, I knew so, this was going to bring something home to you. I knew you had something here. I knew it. What? Dirty why? bastard. Why? Hold on. I used to, I used to watch, watch and listen to the show, uh, The Brilliant Idiots. Okay, it's a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. There used to be a, a recurring guest on the show. He's no longer part of the show. Um, but he said that he would do this intentionally to uh, his, up his, his partners. No, 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 no. It was like a power move. Like, you can't get me to do this. I don't have that much self-control. That, that is like it. wild. Wait, hold on. So wait, are you not enjoying the act? It, does, it makes no sense to me. He, he enjoyed more know, knowing that he wanted to make them feel bad for not allowing him to finish. <laughs> How much time have you spent doing this? By the way, this is brilliant. It's, it's not Schultz. It's not Charlemagne. His name is Wax. Uh, a room pull up benefits to increase There's intimacy nothing. with your partners. <laughs> increase yes. intimacy? I feel like that's it's insulting. I mean, it maybe it's Builds tantric. trust and communication. You know, maybe we should talk about Builds. financial literacy for a little while. <laughs> yeah, that, <I> don't <laughs> let's, let's get into the money, shall we? You brought up gooning, bro. I, I just thought that it would be relevant for the show, particularly as we get into some of the things that we're experiencing in the economy. We're basically getting gooned by it. We're getting... <laughs> Okay, we're getting to the edge, JP. but we're not climaxing financially, okay? J JP was gooning on, on uh, at the Senate committee today. Yeah, he was like, ah, we're close, but we're not there yet. I need a little more confidence. Yeah, I'm not more. sure I'm going to give you that rate cut. Yeah. Well, uh, Arun, if you could do me a favor and pull up the, the show notes in addition to this, it would be very helpful for me to keep a, a structure going. I know it's been a while since you've been on the show again. This is the higher standard, just so you know. There's literally I know, just article. links. I know, I know. All right, so according to Global Market Investor, uh, a little X page that I follow, U.S. bankruptcies hit the highest level in not one, not two, but 14 magnificent years. Come on. So before I tell you you're right, let me finish. Okay. Don't goon. Okay. okay. I told you it's relevant the entire said, show. I literally said this shit a year ago. I, you did say this shit a year, but... 14 years. We have 14 years of artificial interest rate deflation, which led us to where we are now. So to see bankruptcy at the highest rate they've been since then, it's very telling. Right. Let's go farther down the, the daisy chain here. There have been 346 bankruptcy filings in the United States year to date, the most since 2010. Mind you, that's only through June. Exactly. Okay. Shockingly, in June alone, there were 75 bankruptcies, higher than every single month during the COVID crisis, every single month during the COVID crisis. And, of course, this says hard landing is now the base case. So is that 20, like 20% of the whole figure? Damn. Yeah, it's a lot. So you are seeing a severe uptick, which Saeed did call very, 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 very early on and has been watchfully keeping an eye on for a prolonged period of time. And as much as I hate to say it, Saeed, you called this one. The only reason why... If the right uh, doesn't take a genius. The writing was on the walls. I'm not going to try to pat myself on the back too hard here. But the Fed came out and said we knew that they were going to hold rates for an extremely long period of time. There's a lot of zombie companies out there, meaning that they're literally just getting by. Not e They're not, not even profitable, right? And the Fed has continued to send that message. So you know that they're hanging on for dear life, right? They need their their, you know— Working capital loans renewed, and banks are like, "No, we we can't renew your loan. What are you? What are they going to do?" Yeah, and it's it's going to be a problem. I think people are really concerned about a lot of things that are getting repriced in the market, and that's you know single family loans, multifamily loans, loans of all types that were fixed for periods of time that were adjustable afterward. They're worried about all these things in the market, and it's not just business loans. So certainly, it's all sectors here. But I wanted to start with this because I think it gives you a flavor of how dire. The economy is right now and how sensitive it is despite things like jerome powell i have a quick question real quick sorry oh, just call out. For your quick question real quick <laughs> honestly i love your backbone questions yeah oh yeah um so it says june alone there were 75 bankruptcies is this for people these companies like who is the 75 no these these are companies okay just want to make sure that i didn't see anything in the other yeah. yeah if you look at the smp um the note there at the very bottom, if you want to read that. I can't read it very far. It's too far it includes away. S&P Global Market Intelligence covered U.S. companies that announced a bankruptcy between January 1st, okay. 2010 and June 30th, 2024. Yeah, good clarifying question, though. I, I probably should have addressed that. Uh, my bad. Yeah. Thank you. Wait a minute. Look stupid on the show, Arun. Damn it. 
I do what so, I can. Yeah, I know you do. So this sets the tone for what I want to talk about in detail. And we're going to talk a lot about red flags today. Ooh. Red, yeah. Okay. There's a lot of red flags in the economy. And red flags that we have called out in bits and pieces over the course of the last year, two years or so. Some of which we've been sounding the alarm on for a long time. Yep, and we're going to go down the path. Jobs are certainly going to be part of this conversation. Housing is going to be part of this conversation in, in more than one way. I think the housing stuff's pretty impactful. And then we're going to end with comparing regions of, of the housing market, uh, north, south, east, and west. And I think you're going to be really surprised by the data because one region in particular is showing really, really shocking similarities to the great financial crisis in their housing recession. Wow. So we will get there. Let's go on to jobs, shall we, Arun? Let's do it. So according to Game of Trades, job <laughs> openings have been rapidly declining. Such sharp drops have only occurred three times since 2000. And uh, for those of you who may be saying, what three times were those? Mm. The dot-com bubble, that was a recession. The financial crisis, that was also a recession. And the pandemic, which, manufactured or not, was defined as a recessionary economy. Right. And that slight uptick that you're seeing at, at the end over there is was this last month and actually the um, the social media content that I was creating for for tomorrow. It was the, what we talked about in the last episode where the job openings ticked up. But we have to remember that people aren't racing to their job postings and taking them down. Right. They're so, not. And we've also seen a clear and the data supports this a clear Increase in part-time jobs and decrease in full-time jobs. And decrease exactly. So this number is actually significantly worse than what's being represented. Oh yeah, and they've been revised down, and the revisions now are so universally understood to be revised down consistently mm -hmm. that it's not even news anymore. People are just this is happening. Right. This yeah. is this is real. Yeah, and th this is one of those like lagging indicators that we've talked about. Right. It's it's the initial jobless claims. Those are the ones that are leading indicators. But something like this, it takes a long time. What makes it a lagging indicator? First of all, a lagging indicator is something that is supposed to allow you to look into the future as to what's going to happen with you know the economic data, right, and what's going on in the economy. This data point of job openings is a lagging indicator because it takes a long time for companies to you know correct whatever postings they have, or you can't really rely on this information to to see what's happening because there's still eight million jobs posted. Right, mm -hmm. that's almost two jobs for every unemployed person, and it's like, like that's not painting the right picture. I don't see this. Whenever I look at the economy and people like, I just, I don't see this much fluidity in the job market. No, I, I know that this is what the data is saying. I where and 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 something like this is the data point that you'll have certain uh, people say that the economy is booming, the economy is doing great. Look at how many job openings there are. You're like, no, if you understood the underlying data, you'd be like, that's bullshit data. It, it's absolutely bullshit data. And uh, to your point, all of three of those economic indicators, the dot-com bubble, the financial crisis, and the pandemic, where you saw this sharp drop in jobs, all three of them ended in an economic downturn, a recession. Mm -hmm. The worst part is this is also happening at the same time the consumer has run out of savings, post-pandemic savings. We refer a lot to the pandemic era savings being, I guess, elevated. All that's gone. And we are holding uh, a record level of credit card debt with a significant drop off in savings while jobs are decreasing. That is not what I would call a cocktail or recipe for a good time. Arun has brought up the chart, which just shows you basically a 45 degree angle straight down since uh, call it mid 2021 to 2022. And uh, it's, it's very clearly on a downward trend. What's important to note though, with this jobs opening decline is you had more jobs in the economy Leading than you did leading into the great financial crisis, you had frankly double the jobs in the economy. You had more jobs leading into the dot com bubble, and you had certainly a lot more jobs than you had even at its prior height leading into the pandemic. Right. So you had way, way, way more jobs, which to my mind means you've got way farther down to go. Exactly. So the other thing too here is if you were to look up so a common used website you, that people go to for data is the uh, Federal Reserve Economic Data, FRED. FRED, yeah. Right? And people like I to- I hate that name, anecdotally. I hate it, it too. It confuses me because I feel like you're talking about a person. Oh, FRED said this. You're like, oh, did he now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But FRED sounds like a trusted it's, name. It's very confusing. FRED's a trusted guy. Is it? I mean, that that's what they were aiming for. You wouldn't trust a Ralph? No, they're because their grocery prices are crazy, man. That's Ralph's. 
Yeah. I mean, it's Ralph's groceries. It's Ralph. You're a Trader Joe guy? I am a huge Trader Joe guy. I know. You can tell. I can tell. Yeah. Um, Jelly roll. If you, <laughs> if you were to go over to Fred's data and look up real gross domestic product, right? That's the data point that measures how well the economy is doing, how healthy the economy is. And what the, what it tells you the economy is healthy is if it's growing, right? And if you go and you look at this, it's going up. It's been ticking up, ticking up, ticking up. So you think, wow, we're in a great position. We're growing. But what makes an economy healthy, right, is growth, mm-hmm. consistent growth that you can count on. But it's actually decreasing, right? It's going down at, at a fast cadence. And what measures that growth? Spending. But what are we seeing? So that number is telling you that the economy is growing, but credit card balances are growing are going up. So the spending is going on people's credit card debt. Yes. Home equity loans. People are taking out equity from their homes mm-hmm. to buy shit. Yes. So that tell. So if you read between the lines, that is not a healthy economy. No. No. So it's not healthy. Well, people would say, "Well, Chris, house prices are going nothing but up." Those aren't going down. It's a lagging indicator. We're not seeing any 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 problems here. Well, according to Lance Lambert, uh, that's not true. That's your boy. He is a good uh, housing economist. So this chart that uh, Arun has, uh, and he's going to pull up here momentarily, shows <laughs> the 50 housing markets where home prices are down the most from the peak. Of note on the list, you know how you got on social media recently and you see your friend, Jimmy, Jimmy moved to Austin. Oh, yeah, of course. Because he was chasing that wonderlust life. All the good-looking kids out there. The that's, new, that's the new L.A., brother. The new construction out there. New construction. Everyone's cold plunging. Everybody's, Everybody's in shape. Everyone looks like they're trying to, you know, they're best oh, friends with Joe Rogan. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I can't have you. Let's see, now you're being disingenuous. My cold plunge is empty right now, brother. Brother. There's no water in it. Yeah, because you've been rearranging. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter. (laughs) (laughs) Top of the list is Austin, Texas. Down, uh, well, since its peak, 18%. Actually, a little bit more than 18%. 18.5%. Wow. That is a huge pivot since the 2022 peak. And they're down uh, a good amount at 18%. Mm -hmm. That's a lot, man. Can you imagine you moved out there in 2022? You bought... And your home price is now down 18%? But it's down 18%, right, since 2022, but it's up 40%? Is that since what that March says? of 2022. Uh, since March of 2020. Yeah, 2020, yeah. So there you're you still on the positive. I mean, that shows, that, look at that. It still ne- has to come down significantly more. Yeah, but uh, not so uh, good for other states. Uh, Natchez uh, MS, was it Mississippi? Mm-hmm. Down 24% from its peak, only 4.8% up from 2020. But if you wanted a loser, there's one, two, three that are down 16% or more from their March of 2020 peak. Damn. Shout out to New Mexico, dude. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ruin leaves and it's all done. So what's, impor- <laughs> what's important to note here is since March of 2020, the overwhelming majority on this list are still net positive or up, mm-hmm. right? But... That being said, the trends in the last two years show strong and consistent declines in all of these top 50. All of them. All of them are showing downward trends in the past two years. I mean, you look at some of these people that got in in the last two years. Imagine people who got in the last year that have higher mortgage rates, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. How much have they come down? And they're literally looking at a situation where they're underwater. And so... If they were to, if there is a real uptick in unemployment, I would not be surprised if you see like some major sell off in certain regions of the country. Well, I'm glad you noted that. Yeah, segue game on point. Let's take a little trip down to uh, down to Nick Gurley. Nick Gurley vis a vis X. I am a fan of his company, Reventure. Love their data. And we got a couple charts to show you tonight. Uh, the first one, it's probably the easiest and simplest to show you. Price cuts in the U.S. housing market just hit their highest level in six years. If you're cutting home values at a faster cadence than you have in the last six years, that's uh, that means home values are likely going to go down. So 
why do you think people are having to cut their home values? Their listings, right? Their list price? Well, with the interest rates as high as they are and home values as high as they are, okay? You're not going to decrease interest rates anytime soon. The Fed has been somewhat difficult to cut rates with. Uh, they're, they're not having that conversation. Although you've seen the world interest rate probability show a 70% probability of a rate cut now in September and another a little over 70% in December. But uh, let's be clear, with 24.3% of sellers reducing the price of their house in June of 2024, that's the highest rate since 2018, a signal that there will be a downward pressure on home prices in the second half of 2024. So you've already heard that you're seeing a lot of these markets with Austin leading the way with downward trends in the pricing. This is only indicative of the fact that you're going to see continued downward pressure through the rest of the year. Okay. So if you if you were somebody that's been sitting on the sidelines, you just continue to wait? Well, I think when you get a rate cut, you're going to see if you can move quickly enough at the start at the start of a rate cut, if you see mortgage rates drop, and that's a big if because we've talked about on the show how that that's not necessarily intertwined as people think that it is. If you see mortgage rates drop, you're going to see home prices pick up a little bit because people are going to rush in to buy. Remember that there's only two ways that you can really adjust for home affordability. Lower rates, lower home prices, right? Mm -hmm. If you lower rates, you will effectively increase affordability. If you lower home prices, you will increase affordability. Right now, you're seeing home values go down because rates aren't going to go down, right? This is the only one of those two that can, get, that can give at the moment. But if you see mortgage rates get cut low enough to where people can buy more home, they will and drive prices back up. It's a subtle balance, and it's part of the reason why the Fed doesn't want to cut rates too soon because this has not been controlled yet as far as the data is concerned. So your boy JP that was testifying in front of the Senate today. Oh, Jerome. Yep. So he was asked about, you know, housing. Yes, he was. Right? And he said, yes, housing market remains strong, but he did notice that the unemployment rate has been slowly ticking up. Yeah. So the unemployment rate, that jobs report came out uh, last Friday, and we're now at 4.1% for unemployment. Okay? Keep in mind, at their summary of economic projections— they had estimated that it was only going to be at 4%. Okay? I feel like that was a strategic move on their part because, remember, maximum employment is one of two of their dual mandate. Okay? So it almost gives them an out to have to cut before. So if unemployment continues to go up at the next, at the next meeting, at the next jobs report, it goes up to 4.2%. And then at September, 4.3%. Even if we're not on a downward cadence enough for them to justify why they're cutting rates because we're not hitting that 2% target range, they could rest on the fact that, A, part of our dual mandate is to make sure that there's maximum employment. And he also went out of his way to subtly drop in several times today that there is a growing fear that if we were to cut late, then, you know, there could be real, real problems. We should probably talk about the Fed's dot plot, plot map uh, that comes out with the Summary of Economic Projections quarterly mm -hmm. um, at the end of this segment just to kind of give people something to look at. I, I would love to. Okay, let's do that after this. Uh, Arun, if you can go to the next chart, please. Uh, I believe that was also uh, Reventure uh, Nick Early. Oh, thank you. That's the one. So Nick Early, again, a massive housing bubble has developed, and it's about to pop in the south. Okay, in the South, the number of new homes for sale in the southern, southern region, which includes Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, Texas, et cetera, has spiked up to nearly 300,000. This is the highest level of all time. I feel like that's a pretty powerful statement. Okay. <laughs> Since we started tracking this, it's yeah. now the highest level. Even higher than the previous bubble, which peaked in... August of 2006, pre-great financial crisis, before the massive crash. Many people want you to think this time is different in the housing market. Nick Gurley concludes with, it isn't. So let me ask you, so why do you think this is? So remember, the, people have to pay attention to, you know, the exact words being used. Mm -hmm. The highest amount for new homes for sale. Yes. What does that tell me? When I hear something like that, developers that have developed these homes are now try are realizing that values are only going to go down from here. We need to get as much of our inventory online mm -hmm. as quickly as possible to make sure that those profit margins are okay. Otherwise, if values come down too far, 
then guess who's eating that cost? So on previous shows, we talked about how there was overdevelopment of multifamily apartments, particularly luxury multifamily apartment buildings in what is now defined. Are you wearing a bracelet? Yeah, my son made this for me. It's a little rubber band at camp. Oh. Yeah. But I feel bad. One of the rubber, it's stretching, so he's got to remake it. That's so cute. Yeah. You did this. I did not do this. You talked a lot of shit on my bracelets, buddy. <laughs> but hold on. You called me. I'm not I'm not being wholesome dad right now. You asked about no, this. No, no, but you talked a lot of trash on my bracelets, and now that you're wearing one. That should tell you. Souls. That that should tell you a lot. Yeah, I influenced your style. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> So we talked a lot about how high-end luxury apartment buildings in the South in particular, Florida, Georgia, Texas, Tennessee, the South, mm-hmm. had uh, been overdeveloped. And as a result of that, you were seeing increased vacancy and, frankly, defaults in the multifamily space in that region. But that it should not be considered to impact the rest of the country because there wasn't the same overdevelopment. Well, new homes were no different. Think about the exodus from California. Think about the exodus from New York. Where did they go? They went to Florida. They went to Texas. They went to, in some cases, Las Vegas. But the South is where you saw a lot of people transplant to that were leaving to go to tax shelters, tax havens from other high tax areas. And as a result of that, you saw people with more money selling their property in these more expensive, usually affluent states where they had higher taxes and going to these other locations where they could buy more house. So what happens? Developers go, oh, my God. We can sell these houses for more money. The people who have more money, they start overbuilding the same way they overbuilt apartments. And look at Austin. You saw that 18% correction from its peak in 2022. Well, this is exactly what's happening is now you're seeing more inventory be delivered to the market. There's more options. In order to be competitive, you have to price down. Mm-hmm. In, order to, in order to price down, well, you have to be willing to make less money. And as you make less money and race to the same, again, that's the, that's the thing you can adjust. The variable you can account for is the price and the, and the value. So you're going to start to see home values start to decrease. Will it actually be a complete housing bubble nationwide? Well, Arun, next slide. Let's go. Because this is very much a regional problem. It is very much a regional problem. But it's not just the South. There are implications in other regions. Arun, you're having a difficult time finding the slide there, buddy. So they... Keep going down. Keep going down. It's usually... There it is. There it is. It's usually divided into four regions, right? Mm -hmm. North, South, East, West, right? South. I mean, it's the, the Northwest. Right? No, it, it's there. There you go. Okay. One more thing. We won't see a housing crash in the Northeast and the Midwest, okay? But, excuse me, a little burpy. <laughs> that, was, that was awkward. Not the kind that gives you a six pack? Yeah, it's, it, tastes, it tastes like nachos. Uh, home building uh, in the Northeast and the Midwest was very low, okay? Because if you think about the Northeast and Midwest, there just wasn't as many people going to move to those areas. They were going to these tax shelters, right, in the South. And as a result, its speculative inventory activity was also very minimal. So prices in these regions are also less overvalued, and inventory is much lower. So if you look at the new homes for sale chart that Arun pulled up from 1973 to 2024, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, as put together by Reventure, you can see that the South, when overlaid with... The uh, Northeast and the Midwest and, well, frankly, uh, the West, you wind up with a very, very different perspective. But I would point out the West is also creeping up. Now, certainly nowhere near the extent the South is, but the rest of the country outside of the West and the South appears to be stable and consistent as far as new homes for sale. But the West is very much at the 2008 levels. It's very close to the peak. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not as as visceral of, of an increase and decrease. Mm-hmm. But you were you were you were approaching pre pre great financial crisis peak, and you were approaching what I would call the highest number in history. Yeah, because look, if you look at the great financial crisis, right? Because that's the most recent thing that we can look back on, because we remember that time so well. That peak was right before the crisis, mm-hmm. right? Yep. It looks like it's around two thousand six, two thousand seven, mm-hmm. right? Wow. And if you also look, if you want to look at the great financial crisis in the West in particular. It peaked at 134K, right, in as number of units for sale. But there was also a blip down right before the blip up to that. If you look where we're at now, you saw a blip down and a blip back up. It's uh, very similar from a data point perspective. Go back to the 1980s. Look at the, the max out peak there. There was a blip down right before there was a blip up. You're right. This yeah. is a very common statistical trend when you see a peak. Now, not all housing, not all recessions are housing recessions, certainly, but You cannot deny the similarities. Now, go to the south region here. You saw the same increase up, a blip down, and then spike up, and then down. 
look at where we are now in the south it's very similar to the way up and it's working its way back down wow man so the, the trending is very 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 much aligned in the housing market and this there, there are red flags here the, the housing market is flashing red flags of stress and concern and look my own aunt called me recently and she wanted to buy a property and she's been looking on our black crown app so i see every time she's looking at properties every day and I almost feel bad because our own app has gamified this for her where she feels like she needs to win, and I can see her logging in and constantly checking, and I'm like, yes, the app works. I'm like, fuck, she's addicted. <laughs> you know, it's like it's, it's very emotional for me. But I can see her logging in, and she's trying to win a home. She put, in um, Southern California, she bid $60,000 over list price on a $700,000 property. She admitted to me this would stress her financial situation greatly. I know, still approximately still thirty percent of uh, homes that you know sell are still being bought at above list, right? Which, which is slight around normal times, but it's still too high for my liking, but given con- where we are in the market. But for context, we know in the West where Southern California is, yeah, that's still driving prices up, mm-hmm. which means you are likely going to wind up at the peak, the height, the highest number ever of new homes for sale, and you are likely going to see some really interesting problems in the West and the South as this develops. Now, for those of you listening to the show before, my my historical philosophy when it comes to real estate values is you see appreciation on the coasts and then it goes inward to the Midwest. You see depreciation in the Midwest and then it goes outward to the coasts, right? I think you're gonna see a very similar trend led by the South and the West that will affect the rest of the country over time. Yeah, I do, I do feel like once housing starts to come down and if it, comes down you know long enough buyers will continue to wait on the sideline for it to continue to come down i think you're already starting to see that on some level i think in some places where they're more affluent people feel like look there there is a rhetoric that cannot be denied about how people are greatly afraid of arun actually keep that keep that on the the chart up there yeah that's no no no, 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 there you go yeah keep the fed dot plot up we'll talk about that in a minute people are 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 afraid if they don't buy they're not going to build wealth because that has been the classic american philosophy i would argue that in an economy where it is cheaper to rent in all 50 states as much as this painfully sounds like grant cardone you need to think about your cash flow it might be best to use your free cash flow from renting to invest in a disciplined structured way than it would be to buy a home and pay a whole ton of interest up front at a higher interest rate just kind of analytics you have to go through. So this is the Fed dot plot that Arun pulled up. And as Saeed and I were talking about earlier, this is every quarter you get this. So it's often misunderstood. Uh, it, it's supposed to be a visual representation used by the Fed uh, to provide some insight into individual projections of the FOMC members, right? Even the non-voting members who use crayons. Neil Kashkari. Yeah, I didn't say it. I said it. Yeah. So it sounds like a lot, but it's actually really simple. It's a chart, and on the chart, you've got a few columns, okay? You've got a vertical axis, uh, axis which goes from zero typically to about 7%, uh, to show you kind of where they think rates might wind up for a Fed funds rate. On the uh, x-axis, or the horizontal axis, you usually have it blocked by the current year, the next two years, and the last column is indicative of where they see it going in the future. Right, exactly, and th- this is their way of showing you, given the information that they have during now, this snapshot in time, mm-hmm. this is where we see you know, the Fed funds rate going. Yes. So what you're going to see is a cluster of dots. And you go like, Chris, what, what the shit is this? Why do I care about what these cluster of dots are? So the idea is the members will all put down their thoughts of where they see this year ending, next year ending, or the future where they're going to go. The more dots that are together, the more consensus there is, the more aligned the Fed is on their belief of where rates are likely going to wind up. The more widespread or dispersed the dots are, the less um, adoption you have uh, of consistent ideology of where things are going to go. Now, in my working experience, you see the Fed dot plot come up on the SEP every quarter. They're almost always aligned. They all kind of all represent the same thing. Mm -hmm. And there's usually one asshole outlier. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Waller. Yeah. Waller. Uh, but generally speaking, you see a cluster. And the idea is that's supposed to give you an idea of what the group thinks in general of where rates are going to go. So if you ever want to go, hey, Chris, like, you know, 
What does the Fed think rates are going to look like next year? You can go to this every quarter, take a look, and you can get an idea. Yeah, and especially if you think that, remember, mortgage rates are tied to the 10-year treasury, right? Now, there's some people out there that believe that the 10-year treasury is then is ultimately partially influenced by this, right? True. Yeah. Some people do believe that, right? They are not tied to one another, but sometimes it, it correlates, right? So... um, if you do believe that, then you can kind of see that, okay, if things go according to plan, then mortgage rates will come down in year 2025. Yeah. I think that's probably a fair bet at this point in time. Uh, you're seeing an increased uh, probability of rate cuts in September and December this year, although there's been a lot of volatility as you get closer to September, certainly after the July meeting and you have a holding of rates, you, you will we'll get a better feel for what the probability of, of, of a rate cut is. But Right now, it's about 70% for September, a little more than that for, for December. But certainly by 2025, we expect to see rate cut. So uh, I didn't get to finish what I wanted to say about earlier about what JP said about housing. So he asked, for housing supply, because you know, the question came up, one of the senators asked him about supply on the market, right, yeah. and how it's a major issue right now. He said, for housing supply, the best thing we can do is to get inflation back under control so that rates can come back down, right? Cause oh, was, yeah, yeah, so, I saw that. So what he's saying yeah. is if we can get – inflation down then i can cut rates then mortgage rates will come down therefore people will list their homes again that's what he's saying right but then he goes on to say but supply isn't our responsibility that's somebody yeah. else's responsibility i saw that and then he also went on to say so some the same senator pinged him on institutional buyers in the market and he basically said that he didn't number one think that was a, a significant problem uh that it wasn't as widespread as the rhetoric was on on uh, the news and everywhere else that were mm. reporting these numbers but also that that wasn't really his prerogative but here's the here's the here's the messed up part. It is partially your responsibility. CPI inflation, shelter is a component of inflation. Yeah, I know. So he needs it. He needs for it to come down in order to get to his two percent target range. So but it he doesn't is, need you to know that. Yeah, it is kind <laughs> of your responsibility, dog. It's all intertwined. Yeah. That, that's the sad part about spending is everybody spends when they have money, and nobody spends when they don't. Yeah. Unless you have a credit card, in which case you spend in the current climate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and real quick, real quick, real quick. If you're listening to this show on Apple or Spotify, please head over and leave us an honest five star review. You're now 56 minutes in. Come on now, you've enjoyed the show. If you listen this far and you didn't leave us a review, it's like what are you doing? We know a lot of you are listening and not leaving reviews. Some listeners are going so far as to jump off Spotify because Spotify is kind of shady. You can leave stars. Yeah, you can leave the stars. We see, we see you guys leaving the stars. We appreciate that. But they jump on over to YouTube or hit us in the DM with the review so that we can read. We really appreciate it. If you're watching us over on YouTube, please make sure you subscribe. Ring that notification bell. Hit that like button. Let's get this video to as many people as possible. Do all the moist, goody good stuff. Rune, give it to me, baby. Let's go. Okay. That, that's. <laughs> I like oh, it. Holy shit. I like it. Serial sperm donor Jonathan Mayer slams Netflix docuseries, threatens slander suit. So he's this. I didn't know this docuseries. The man with a thousand kids that he mixed his sperm with another donor's is a blatant lie. Wait, you guys don't oh, know is about it, this wait, guy? Oh, wait, is this the guy that was... Um, what kind of shit are you he, watching did he on run Netflix? The, did he run the sperm bank? He didn't run it. He just would go and, like, donate or get paid for it or whatever it's called. He would get paid. Uh, so he, he sperm went, donor. He went a thousand times? Not a thousand. Basically, he's saying he has 550 kids out there. Not so a, thousand. a thousand. So, oh, okay. So that's Netflix. much better. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I forgot where this was. I mean, exactly. how, how is he sure, that, how is he sure that the teacher, some, some, or the teachers, the moms didn't have twins? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I forgot where this was. I think he was in the Netherlands and they kicked him out. They're just like, you can't do this anymore. So he left and went to Austria instead. To keep doing it? <laughs> yep. Wait. Why? I'm surprised. I'm surprised you don't know about this. Yeah, they made the movie about him. Um, this is not what I watch on Netflix. I don't right know, now. bro. Yeah, I, a, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, bro. Yeah, I, I'm not. A, this, is I kinda, don't, this kind of feels like it hits your I, feet. I got, <laughs> <laughs> my feet is all cartoons right now on Netflix. It's yeah. been dominated. Yeah. This is an actual series? What do they show him? Yeah. Masturbating 550 times? Bro. Like, what I'm, I'm intrigued. At this point, I'm intrigued. Is that him? Yeah. Huh. And he's holding a baby. That's kind of creepy, dude. That's very That's bizarre. That's really, really yeah, His creepy. whole thing is like, um, I've been helping families. I don't understand why people are like 
uh, poking fun at me and stuff like that. Like I've been helping families. Well, I mean, if he's getting paid to do it and it's disclosed and he's not hiding anything, I mean, it's not a crime. I don't. He know, first began donating. So much about he this. did tell the family's exact number of children he had helped to create, but he later chose to stop giving out the real estimate. Technically, I did not lie. Oh well, yeah, it's true. I mean, he started back in 2007. He was doing this at 11 fertility clinics in Netherlands. Um, despite was it the, financially lucrative or something? Um, honestly, I have no idea. But um, there are some regulations. He was just ignoring them. Like, 11 only... clinics, bro. Wait, Wait, hold on. I want to get your take on this. This is not going to be a good line of question. <laughs> Jesus. Hold on. Is, how do you feel about this? Is this? Do you feel like he's providing like uh, a charitable donation? Like this is a good thing for society? No, he's doing this for money. I mean, but. I mean, he had to have gotten paid, right, for the docuseries? No, 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 I don't think he did. He wasn't included in it. I don't know. I, I just read that he wasn't included in it. But, look, I, I don't want to see his YouTube. Please don't. I, I just I don't. want to know if he has a following. 16.5K subscribers. Ha! Less than the higher standard, bitch! Let's go! <laughs> <laughs> and maybe, maybe, you, maybe you can come on and help him out. Why did I become a <laughs> Look, I, I don't... Um, <laughs> I don't have a stance on this. Like, I get some people have find it very difficult to conceive. Um, I fully get that, but no, no, that aspect of it, I get. No, going to a clinic to get receive the d donation, I fully understand. I'm aware, but come on, there's got to be like a threshold, right? Well, I mean, why? Because you're worried about him genetically spreading his seed too much. Right, he, he's, 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 try, he's trying he's to be Genghis, Genghis Khan. Khan. He's, oh, oh, gang, gang. I mean, I don't know. Is is well? I mean, look, I don't. I don't know how this works. Have when you, you heard that stat about Genghis Khan? By yeah, way? I have. He's fathered pretty much everybody. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, Everybody's got a little Genghis Khan in them. Like, like, a ha like less than a half of one percent. That's a lot. His testosterone level. That's a really lot, bro. <laughs> like, he must have had crazy high natural testosterone. I gotta be honest, man. That at some point, like, with with the, the amount of babies that he's a, allegedly fathered, like, yeah, you gotta get tired, right? <laughs> you don't care, bro. You can't be conquering nations and impregnating babies everywhere you go without like getting tired. I just always go back to the, like, at what point do you go from being this, the worst human being alive to being celebrated as the greatest emperor ever? I don't celebrate any emperors. Maybe I don't did. either. But I'm like, you bro, just said, bro, he's he's got restaurants in the food court. <laughs> it's called gang, <laughs> it's called Genghis Khan, bro. I think he would find that disrespectful. Of course he. Would. So you think? Oh, so you think society's getting back at him? I think this is, the karma's got a weird way of fucking you up. You're now a food court restaurant. Congratulations. Yeah, exactly. You're basically a hot dog on a stick. <laughs> Okay. Dude, they've, those vanished. They're like nowhere. Did they really? Yeah. I did not know that. All right, so this has been pulling up on my TikTok. I have no idea who the hell this is. This, I, 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 don't know, no I don't even know if I'm allowed to look at this. This seems like <laughs> JoJo Siwa. Yeah, so transfers. basically she was like this teen bopper uh, pop culture musician, and this is her when she was younger, and then when her she turned 18, and now she's 21, and she's just getting drunk everywhere she goes. She went to Disney World a few weekends ago. and She, she got popular off TikTok? Um, no, she's been popular. What's with the kiss look, look, look going on here? I have no idea. That's her new look. That she's a bad bitch. Like I think. That's like, okay, so she's, she's going. Why is she next to a Viagra ad? Well, by the way? I, that's just I, awkward. This is your computer. You tell me, dude. dude it's your do computer, that. bro. Don't do that. Hold on. When that's I see this, when I see this, it makes me. It makes genuinely makes me sad. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's like I'm sure the pressures of being a childhood star are not spectacular. Did you have anything positive to talk about tonight, Arun? Come on. Man. Yeah. Are you told us earlier there's going to be a game? Yeah, we're going to go to the game next. Okay. Gladiator 2, this. baby! Oh, I did not know. Denzel, bro? Are you for real? You haven't seen the... Oh, my I God. I have not seen the trailer for I this. I sent you guys a link of the guy doing the Denzel voice with this picture in the background. I didn't know what that was. Bro, he, That was this. He, yeah. So there's an African-American dude and who's I a love, heavyset guy with I dreadlocks. Love that, I love that actor, too, from Narcos. Oh, yeah. Peter Pascal? Yeah. Yeah. So there's an African-American dude, heavyset, dreadlocks, right? Doesn't look like he would have Denzel voices in him. He does the best Denzel Washington impression I have ever seen in my entire life. Come on, so better was, than Jamie Foxx? Oh, by far. Because, like, the guy's face even aligns with, like, the same weird, almost, like, ticky-like mannerisms that, that he has. And it, so he does, like, lines from what he thinks will be the movie. Rome didn't fall on me. I fell on Rome. Like, the whole thing. He does the whole thing. No way. And it's, it's I mean, I, it's amazing. So, but, yeah, this is going to be... I normally would not like a movie like this where it was clearly meant to be an end mm -hmm. when Ridley Scott did the first one, and obviously you're not bringing back who was the you know star of that one to do this one. But 
Yeah, that's actually like one of my top three favorite movies. Of yeah, all time. no, I mean this is in the future, so this is like after his death, like yeah. Maximus's death, and no way. Um, yeah, so this is the little kid grown up now. Maximus's little kid, yeah. Well, Maximus not his is, kid. No, his kid. His kid died. No, like the the what is it? Caesar's nephew. Joaquin yeah. Phoenix's. Joaquin Phoenix's yeah, Joaquin Phoenix's. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, yeah. look, I, I'm excited to see it. I think it's yeah, good. exactly. So my question was. Has there ever been a sequel that you were super excited about? Like, when I saw this today, I didn't even know it came out yet. Ooh, so when sequel. I saw this, I was like, oh, shit, this looks fire. If I'm being honest. Oh. Like. Minions. All. <laughs> 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 it's funny because it's true. <laughs> I saw this weekend. <laughs> Me too. Um, I think the, all the ocean sequels. No, no. I love them, man. What? No. I love them. I love all of them. Beetlejuice, bro. Beetlejuice. Come I'm excited on. as fuck, boy. I can't <laughs> wait to see it. That's nostalgia right all over it. Bro, he was a team when the first one came out, so he's Beetlejuice. It was. I, I, oh, I was say fuck. one more time. Say one more time. We get fucked. <laughs> Beetlejuice. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can, I can understand that. There's a lot of nostalgia there, but, bro, there's literally no cooler group of guys. Fun fact about Beetlejuice. The author of it, right, didn't want to have a sequel come out. So at one point in time, he wrote a sequel that was so asinine. I actually wrote the entire thing that he thought the studio wasn't going to make it. And it was called Beetlejuice Goes to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and he literally wrote a script about Beetlejuice going to Hawaii and pitched it to the studio. And they picked it up and they were going to make it. No. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been terrible. So they decided, obviously, that never got it, never happened, never happened, but they went back to this. But. The whole reason he wrote it is because he didn't want a sequel to come Hilarious. out. Hilarious. Yeah, mm. I think that. Or maybe Space Jam. No. What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> the better one. Oh. All right, last one. Michael Rubin's annual white party. White party bro, these baby. parties look fucking absurd. What is this? In, your invitation to the white party this year was a custom all-white pair of Travis Scott's with your name custom embroidered on it wait, wait, this is in also a suitcase in a customized bag. Everybody who went to this party... Got a custom pair of Travis Scott's customized for them with the invitation. So who's throwing this party? <clears throat> really? Yeah, sorry, I don't know. Michael Rubin, bro. Michael Rubin, oh, we he's, talked about this last year. He's got Daniel, remember we talked about this last year. Arun, you just got to forgive him, okay? He's he's in his little minions bubble, and he ain't going to get out. <laughs> so wait, come on. Everybody who's anybody goes to Michael Rubin's party. You probably didn't get an invite to this party. Me? Bro, it's crazy. So this is so, the title of the article. So this is uh, the party. I mean, we can watch the whole thing, but fuck it. Um... Yeah. Kim Kardashian, Lil Wayne, Mary, Jew, Mary J. Blige, Shibuzi performed this year. Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, Emily Rakowski, Tom Brady, Kim and Chloe, Beyonce, Camila Cabello, Quavo. Come on. Quavo. You got them all right, but Quavo. Quavo. <laughs> Chris Quavo. Glorilla. Megan Thee Stallion, Machine Gun Kelly, ASAP Ferg. Alesso, Travis Scott. I mean, it's pretty much all my homies. Oh, and then a bunch of tech I feel like this party would be lame, bro. What? I'm not gonna lie. Oh, Seems like pulling, so, are you pulling a Billy? Are you pulling? <laughs> no, a Billy? I just feel like everyone there is gonna be so stuck up and not, you know, they're not getting down. That's like the that. idea: is you go acting like you're stuck up too. Oh, what? T Toby Maguire leaving with like a 20 year old girl? Yeah, bro, that's wild shit, dude. Bro, I was like, get the fuck out. Oh, and Drake went to the party. First public yeah. outing since you know. He had to. Oh, uh, they he couldn't. Play, he couldn't not go. They Drake, didn't play a Kendrick song because that's Drake wild, asked though. for it. Yeah, Drake specifically said, "I'll, I'll come to the party." And then Jake's the asshole who shows up wearing off white. Yep. I love that. See, no, that's why no. I love him. Wild foul, bro. What do you mean? I'm not like you guys. It's I'm above a white this. party. It's not an off-white party. But no, he's paying tribute. Come on, man. Bro, people offered $5 million to go to this party, and he said no. Yeah. Who? Michael Rubin don't need your money, bro. He yeah. said no? Yep. Yeah. Wow. This is the party, doc. It's in the Hamptons, too. You know, my people go hang out there. Y'all don't. Y'all can't afford that. Your people. Please define your people. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> help me, help me understand what your people is versus my people. I'm, I'm, non Ivy League, obviously. I'm non. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't part of the Ivies. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. All right, last part. I wanted to do this a few weeks ago. We didn't get to do it. So I'm playing a game now. An hour and eight minutes in. Yeah. yeah if bitch. you're stuck around this long, you're about to, you're about to get a real well, treat. Well, fuck it. Nobody's listening. Oh, dude's yeah, been exactly. apparently <clears throat> planning this game for two weeks. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. It's a trend I've seen. Said it came on your algorithm too, but it's it was yours was different. Was but um, so basically the whole objective it's a draft. You get five picks, he gets five picks. 
Rock, paper, scissors, see who goes first, snake format. So the person that goes Snake format? What person is that? Person that goes first. Okay. Goes is, first. Is Odin, are you in this or is it just No, it's just you two. Why? Because uh, I said so. You're the backbone, bro. That's, <laughs> I said so. hey, that's the DJ backbone. <laughs> I've resisted the boner tr- talk all night long. I know. All right. I so can tell. I've been, uh, yeah. The category is 90s sitcom characters. Oh, Balky Bar Takamos. All right. So that's, your, that's not on the list, bro. That's 90s sitcom. Uh, and then what? So we're drafting. Yeah, we're drafting, and then we're gonna ask our audience for whomever is still listening to rate who wins. So is it, we're doing top five, like our starting five. Yeah. Come on, bro. I got this. That's who you went with, bro. I half, didn't realize it was starting half, five, bro. Fuck like that. Him. You didn't listen to the. You no. don't listen to the rules, dog. All right. Uh, number right, one. Wait. Rock paper scissors. Who goes first? What do you mean, dog? He just went first. That's not that. Okay, you know what? I'll even take it. Fine. I'll take. No, nah, I'm, I'm gonna let you redo it because I don't want to be that asshole. Look how nice I am. I should get to go first because I know that's... exactly who you're going with. So fuck you. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, you already know. What I... Come on, it's no Wait, duh. So who's going first? Me. Because okay. I just I'm giving him another. I'm giving him a full five again instead of go making ahead. him take go that ahead. pick. Will Smith, Fresh Prince. God damn it. Urkel. Damn, that was my second one. <laughs> God, that was so good. I'm not letting you take that one. Okay. All right, you gotta go sec or you gotta go again, Chris. What? No Snake way. Snake format. You got the first pick. So he wow, two. two. Pick two and three so much better than pick one. If you, I, if, I could go all Family Matters. Oh. You could mess this up. No, no, yeah. you, Family Matters is done now. I can't do. I can't. I can't go like. Uncle no, Carl? Saying, yeah, you can. I Carl, mean, you won't go Carl. No, I'm, just, after I'm, just, the, I'm after, asking after the Diddy incident. You. I no. snorted. <laughs> 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 you want to explain what the Diddy incident was? No, no, no. You go look it up for yourself. Um. Wow, I want it. God uh, damn. Let me get this. So many. I got. Hold on, I got to think about my next one. So many. I, ninety sitcom. Mm. I'll go. I'll go left. Uh, I'll go. Hmm. I'll go. Mary Kate Ashley Olsen's character from uh, Full House. Well done. Good yeah. pick. Great pick. Yeah. That's a great pick. That was my next. My. Oh. All right. Zach Morris. God damn it. Ooh, Save by the bell. Nice. Save by the bell. Yeah. I had to do it. Um, damn, the Olsen twins, that was going to be me. Yeah. You know, by the way, I ran into them once when I was in Big Bear when I was like eight years old. Yeah. Okay. It was, literally, we were playing outside and uh, they were walking with, um, was it Uncle Joey? Was that one? Yeah. Yeah. I don't Uncle, know his name. Uncle Joey. Yeah. Not not um, the handsome looking uncle, the other one. That's racist, bro. What's, it's not nothing <laughs> racist, racist about it. AF, Was that his name? Dude. Uh, Come on, man. I don't even know. I think. Uncle Joey was the handsome one. No, that's, that's terrible. Uncle dude. Joey was not the handsome one. Anyways, they were walking with them, and then we're they stopped and we're playing. We we're literally like playing with the snow, and they invited like, "Hey, do you want to come like hang out with us at the house?" And then, are you trying to buy time right now? Yeah, come you're on, right. yeah, Uncle come Jesse. On. Uh, Jesse was a good one. Jesse and Joey, right? Yeah. All right, okay, I was right. Jesse's the handsome one, married to Rebecca. Answer the question, bro. All right. Oh man, um, wait, cartoons too, or whatever you want. Ninety sitcom, bro. Oh, stop buying time. Come on, man. Give me, give me, give me a little bit of time. I'm gonna go with uh, shit. Yeah, five hours to play. Okay. Homer Simpson. <sighs> Kramer. Ooh. Bitch. Great one. Oh, then I got this. You can't, you can't go Jerry right. after that. Ross. I go next, not you. No. Ross. <laughs> <laughs> you can't take my pick, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's my turn. Hell no. You tripped up, homie. Ooh. No, come I on. I was going friends next anyway. No, you weren't, yes, dog. That's, that's a lie. That's <laughs> right. a lie. Put it down, boy. Don't do that. <laughs> hey, man. I, you, you knew it was my turn. No, I did not. You uh, knew that was my turn. You forgot about Ross, bro. Yeah, I'll give you Fran Dresser. Here, go ahead. Huh? <laughs> you okay. can have Fran Dresser, the nanny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, wait. <laughs> you say I can't Dresser. believe you took my Ross, bro. <laughs> wait. wait. <laughs> that was not fair. He's got That was already here, bro. That was not there. That was already Cerebellum. I already that was there. Come on. Um,. I'll My, give you the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Damn, I'll give Ross, you all the was, shit Ross was so comes. good. Then I'm going to go with... Um, uh, my team is stacked. I got to go with... I have to go with Chandler. You can't go back to a sitcom we already named. Yeah, you can. I can. Okay. What do you mean? Doogie Howser, MD, bitch. No. Drop the mic. Hey, Damn. I'm going to take Doogie Howser. No. <laughs> it was my pick. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Yo, my oh, my five on. is my five is stacked. Well, Bro, I gave Chris you Doogie. Is, Chris is uh, no, I I had thought I about it. You. there's come there's on, there's Chris. one other person that I'm thinking about that um I don't want to give you. 
You don't want to give me? Yeah. I gave you Ross Brown. Alf. Silver. Shut up. That's Alf. weak. Alf. Weak. That's not even Dude, nice. you ruined your starting five, bro. You ruined your starting five. I had to give you some Alf, bro. It's oh, 80s. Oh, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not no, don't do that. I got All right. Uh, There's 90s. someone uglier than that. Think about the female listeners, bro. The female. I don't like the. No, I'm not doing on, that. There's... I'm going all original TGIF. I'm gonna do Boy Meets World. Yeah. Ooh, who though? Ooh, the Gotta girl. Gotta say the name. The girl. What, yeah, what's um... her name? Oh my god. God damn it. It, I was, wanna... it was a fucking like alien no, name. Uh, you fucked fuck. up. See, you fucked up. Damn it. Up. Um, man. What was her name? God damn. That's the. That's. that's I could have done the Wonder Years too. That's '90s or. That's that's 80s. 80s. No, that's '90s. Na- no, that's '90s. Boy Meets World. What was her name? I'm going to help Come you out. On, I'm going to give it to you. You want it? I'll give it to you. Yeah, it gives me. Topanga. Topanga. God damn it. Fucked up. Should have been Mr. Feeney. Dude, I ran into her, ran into her at a Feeney. yogurt. Mr. Feeney was a pedophile. Dude. You know, I look up the fence. No, man. No. Mr. Feeney, bro. Don't he do was it. everyone's Don't teacher. do that. Don't he do that. He was everyone's Don't teacher. Do that. He wasn't all, at dude. a ditty party. Fuck you. This game is rigged anyway. I grew up in the 80s, bro. I wasn't even watching TV in the 90s. I was out there doing, you know, work. I was doing work. Yeah. Come on, man. Oh, that's good. All right. So my five Will Smith, Zach Morris, Homer Simpson. For the win, bro. He's still relevant. Chandler, R.I.P. to the GOAT. And uh, you put Dookie. Dookie. <laughs> you put Dookie. Dookie. <laughs> and Chris is Urkel. And then you got uh, Mary Kay and Ashley Olsen twins from Full House. Kramer, Ross, and Topanga. Dude, you, you've you dropped the ball with Topanga, bro. Yeah. Topanga, you really fucked She's up your five. Roseanne. You know what that is? That You know what that is? That's like having Luke Longley as your starting center. <laughs> I'm mad I still Should've win. Should have gone Roseanne, man. Roseanne. Oh, uh, yeah. That's yeah, it. but that's a little controversial. But shoot, I mean. Yeah, I don't want to be so on there. Will Smith. Like, you, you keep your Republican stuff over there, okay, buddy? Will Smith was oh. controversial to who? To Chris Rock? That's it. Oh, no, 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 no. What else did he do? He didn't do anything to anybody. No, no, no. Pretty sure he's canceled. For what? For being Will Smith, obviously. <laughs> Stupid. All right. If he's getting canceled, he's only getting canceled for to who he's married to. Frazier, living single, king of queens. Everybody loves Raymond. Friends, freaks and geeks, sister, sister, home improvement. Shit. Home Tim Allen? Tim Allen. Damn. Will and Grace. Third Rock from the Sun. Martin. Moesha Ellen. Step by step. See, I thought of I thought of Martin, but I was like. Drew Carey. <laughs> king of the Hill. King of the Keenan, Hill. Keenan and Kel. Ke- oh. welcome, welcome to Good Burger. Home of the Good Hang Burger. Hang out with Mr. Cooper. Oh, Mr. Cooper. Sex in the City. Oh, what about uh, oh, um, My Brother and Me? Remember that? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a couple more here. The Nanny, That 70s Show, and Boy Weeks More. That 70s show was in the 90s? Started. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Damn. Dinosaurs, bro. Wait, what about that? Ah, o- what, no, what about that other one from um, with Suzanne Summers from TGI Fridays? Suzanne Summers should have made your starting five, bro. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, and her husband was Michael Duffy. Yeah, what was it? Remember? Uh, it was um, it was on TGI Fridays. It was TGI, the last- TGIF, dude. Don't say TGI Fridays. It's Sorry. a restaurant. Seven bro. steps, or was it? Oh no, step by step. Step yeah. by step. Yeah. Step by step. What dude? What happened to shows like that, man? I know, man. Nobody's was, gonna watch it like that anymore. I huh? learned uh, that. That's that's what helped raise me. Yeah, nobody watched that anymore, huh? There's yeah, and by the way, if you're gonna if you're gonna go Boy Meets World, like. Corey Matthews, bro. No, oh, to- man. Mr. Feeney, dude. He was everyone's teacher. You have to think of, like, what people connect with. So, so I should have gone with Uncle Phil? Yeah. You and Diddy. Or the okay. butler, you know? No, Uncle Phil's it's not. Carl, you're racist, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see the show where they, they met? Carl yeah, he just yeah, showed yeah. up. That was yeah, cool. He just that showed was... up to the episode and they, they uh, hugged him out. Yeah. That was dope. <laughs> yeah, that was before Diddy. All right. Send, <laughs> us, send us a DM or leave us a comment and let us know who you think won. Obviously me. Arun, do you have anything? Nope. Said, Christopher, do you have anything? Nope. All right then. All right then. Call it oh, friendo. Call it friendo? Yeah. Come on. Give me something better than that. You got a pimple on your face? No. Looks do like it. it. Where? I don't know. That's it. Just go check it out. Good night, everybody. Bro, I told you I sucked your teeth. I was nice. Okay, bye.